Hello ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Jeremy Smith. Sorry guys, I haven't been posting to the channel a whole lot these days, but I promise I do have more content coming your way very, very soon. Today though, I wanted to take the opportunity to repost a video from the Bedford Cameron Video Photo Expo Live, uh, which was back in August. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. We had lots of, uh, lots of good questions during the live stream event. And thanks always to Bedford Cameron Video for allowing me the opportunity to speak. It was really good to see many people I haven't seen in a while. Even if things weren't quite exactly normal, um, it was still very good to be able to at least get the opportunity to speak. Um, also, thanks to everyone who came out to the photo walk after, and uh, it was very, very good. I just wanted to take an opportunity to post this video here. Um, as you guys know, I talk a lot about different cameras and things on this channel, different lenses, and um, I might have some brand biases here and there, but the thing that is the most important is lighting. And so what do you suppose I talked about during the photo expo? I talked about one light portrait photography. So anyways, take a look at my presentation. And uh, yeah, I wanted everyone to kind of have an opportunity here on my channel to see this video as well. So as always, write me in the comments below if you have any questions, and there will definitely be more videos in the future. Um, I made a video about portrait lighting patterns some time ago, which I'll put a link to as well. Some of the things I say in this presentation were inspired by that. And for those of you that are interested in doing, uh, and kind of getting started with portrait lighting outdoors, take a look at my flash outside video. Uh, or rather, why flash outside? So take a look at that one too. Anyways, guys, enjoy the rest of the video, and I'll talk to everyone really, really soon. Hey, welcome back to Photo Expo Live at Little Rock Bedford Cameron Video Store. Just want you guys to know that we have all seven stores still open till 6 p.m but the e-store will be running until 12 p.m. on Sunday, or 12 a.m. on Sunday. Uh, it, you can get all the show specials if you use the code EXPO LIVE. But all the stores will be available till six o'clock. Hope you guys have been enjoying the show. It's been a treat for me. It's been a pleasure to meet these amazing presenters that have come out to dedicate their time and talent to give you a good insight into better photography. Our last speaker is a special guy Jeremy the Great Smith. So let me read to you what's on here because it's pretty impressive. So he's a commercial and portrait photographer that's adapt and shooting in studio, but loves photographing his subjects on location. He draws much of his inspiration, not only from his subjects, but from the environment. And his goal is to use available light as well as flash to capture his subjects in the best way possible. And over the years, he's come to this conclusion that less is more when it comes to photography and lighting. Jeremy Smith is based out of the Little Rock store and he is the one and only lighting guy you need to talk to when you come in here. Be sure to check out all of the staff at all the different locations and be sure to get on bedfords.com and hit that code. You still got those things going on until Sunday at 12. And Jeremy's gonna come in, we're gonna kick this off, but don't forget we still have one more in-person event Tonight in the Argento district, Jeremy is going to be doing his lighting demo on a photo walk with actual models. Yes, in Little Rock. So if you're in the area, come join us at 630. And if not, we'll see you real soon. Jeremy, great to see you, sir. Yeah. All Good right. You, Robert. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Oh yes, I guess I'll take off my mask so you can see my entire face. All right, guys. So yes, as Robert mentioned, uh, I am primarily a portrait photographer. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a favor before I get started. I really want you guys to, to do me a favor and write in the comments as we go about things. Because honestly, guys, I am got, I'm kind of having a hard time with not seeing everyone's smiling faces. I always draw a lot of inspiration from the audience. So it's a little bit weird, honestly, uh, thanks to this global pandemic. It's a bit weird just being here and seeing like, you know, just the same few faces and, uh, and not having that audience interaction. So definitely write me as I talk about things. 
If you have questions, uh, if we do run out of time, I will go back and answer those questions at a later time, so don't be shy. Definitely write me. Um, okay, so as Robert mentioned, I am a portrait photographer. I do a lot of things on location. I do things, uh, you know, I go out to people's offices and do business headshots. Oftentimes, I will photograph people outdoors uh, as well. But no matter where we're shooting, we can use a lot of the same types of lighting concepts. Um, if you guys want to see more of my work, you can actually find me on Facebook or Instagram. I am known as Photog J the Great. Uh, that is, that is um, not just because I'm great, it's also because my name is Jeremy Smith, which is a super, super common name. Uh, did you guys know that there's actually like, there's a weightlifter named Jeremy Smith? Uh, and also, I'm actually in a Facebook group, and it's nothing but Jeremy Smith's, and there's like 160 guys in there. And uh, apparently, apparently, they're going to get together and try to break the uh, Guinness Book of World Record for having the most people gathered at the same place with the same name. So... Anyways, I don't have a very, uh, I guess I'm not the unique snowflake that I would like to uh, think that I am, you know. We, uh, there's a lot of Jeremy Smiths out there. So, but if you, if you go and search for Photog Jay the Great, you will find the right one. Uh, you can also find me on my website. You can see my work there. It is jsmith-photography.com. And, you know, about five years ago, I started doing a YouTube channel as well. Because um, at that time, I really wanted to get more into video. I didn't really have anything to film. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more backstory about me. I am actually, I'm actually not a super, super artistic person. I'm actually very, very inspired by more of the technical side of things than I am the artistic side of things. And so in photography, I find that there's all kinds of photographers um, and, and none of them really seem to be completely balanced between tech and art. And I am definitely on the tech side and I have to work on the art side. But the good thing about this is, I basically spend a lot of time with whatever new camera or lens that comes out and that allows me to really you know help others I do spend a lot of time on my YouTube channel making different tutorial videos and reviews so if you guys uh, I'm actually purposely not going to make this very technical today but if you look at my YouTube channel I do spend a lot of time talking about all the nuances of different cameras and different lenses so be sure to check out that as well so that gets us over into where we are right now today. And today we're going to be talking about uh, one light portrait photography. And so a lot of times people may wonder, well, you know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen many photographers do this over the years. You know, they go out and they buy like a big ginormous uh, size lighting kit and they want to just like set up a bunch of lights every time. And guys, I'm, I'm guilty as charged. This is something that I have done many times too. You know, we go to a scene, we don't necessarily uh, look at the light in the scene. We think, man, you know, I've got these four light heads I could use on the shoot, and we want to go and set up everything. But a lot of times, being more minimalistic with our approach can be a really, really good thing. And so one of the things that I like uh, about using just one light is the fact that one light does create a very, very uh, dramatic type of look. Um, a lot of people will get started with lighting and they'll say, okay, Jeremy, I want to, I want to get rid of all the shadows. You know, I've got, I've got these shadows that are appearing on my subject's face. I don't want to see those. Um, and, and they'll want to go in and like use more light. And they end up in a scenario where they basically, well, they basically end up making Xerox portraits of people where it looks like they just took, you know, someone's face and slapped it onto a copy machine. And you just get this very unflattering, just flat light. And so the nice thing about using one light is that you can really create an image with a lot of depth and three-dimensional qualities to it. Um, it's very important to note that shadows, shadows are not a bad thing because whenever we are photographing a human face, we're taking a, we're taking a uh, image and we're capturing something that's three-dimensional, but we're putting it into a two-dimensional type of medium. And so by having our shadows in the image, that's what's going to give us depth and contrast to our scene. Um, many times <clears throat> we'll go out and do different photo walks. Uh, this image here is actually from one of our photo walks. I believe this was from, oh my goodness, the time flies when you're having fun. I believe it was around 2018 that I shot this image during one of our photo walks. And um, so we were just walking along and um, our model Forrest was there and we happened to see this motorcycle and it really, really worked
worked well for the scene. Um, you know, Forrest, uh, he's, he's, he's been working out almost as much as me. So he's, uh, you know, one day he'll get as both as me. But, um, but he does look really nice in this, right? So I wanted to give some, uh, I wanted to put some light on him that would really accentuate that. And uh, this bike was here. And so we ended up, I ended up using a single light source just right off to the side here. And you guys can kind of see where our light is coming from. And I always work very hard to try my best to blend in the available light. So I took several frames here, probably, probably about uh, at least a dozen or so. But I like this one the most because this UPS truck happened to be driving by at that time. And so that's actually also kind of lighting for us on the opposite side. And it's also kind of backlighting this bike. So being aware of those things when you're shooting can be very, very good. Because a lot of times, even though we may be using, in this case, technically I was only using one light. I only brought one light. But the light in the environment really allowed me to uh, have some additional uh, depth uh, to, to my image here. And by the way, if you guys, uh, again, if you guys uh, end up wondering about any of the technical details of these images, just write me and I will answer those questions. I've memorized most all the metadata in these images anyway. Um, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to burden this down, uh, this presentation down with too much jargon. But uh, I will answer those questions if you guys have them. Uh, another image here. Uh, I, tell you, I tell you what, guys. We were, we were talking just before I, I, I went live, uh, before I went live here. And I was talking about how I'm starting to feel old. You know, I'm almost getting as old as Robert. You know, he was talking to me about his, uh, his pains and ailments uh, earlier. And I'm like, man, buddy, I'm almost there with you. Uh, this young lady, when I first photographed her, uh, she was about three years old. And so now, you know, I look at this frame and it's, it's, it's mind-blowing that here she is. She's getting ready to go to college. She has, uh, she has her, her new car here. Um, similar, similar thing going on here. I'm just getting the last little bit of daylight. We got some nice, uh, some nice uh, sunset here. Um, a lot of people will photograph a scene and the sun will still be in the frame, but typically, you get the better sunset whenever the sun is actually just dipped below the horizon when you've got just a little bit of light left. Uh, and here I'm using one light source to kind of put a bit of light on Madison so that way she can be captured along with that beautiful sunset. So, and yeah, same, same one light technique. We get a lot of depth and detail uh, to the image, a lot of contrast. Okay, we'll go to this one here. So similar thing here, this, uh, this, this image was captured back when I was testing uh, my, my, my latest hotness, uh, as I've been calling it, uh, the Sony A1. So every time a new camera comes out, I'm always testing it. And so the A1 came out and, you know, I noticed that the flash sync speed was 1 400th of a second. I thought I'm going to put that to work. So here we have a situation where we have pretty strong backlighting. Uh, this image is captured at the worst time of day. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about time of day as time goes on. But this is captured during the worst time of day. This is like right at high noon. And if you guys have taken photographs outside at high noon, you know that that is not, that is not the most flattering light of the day at all. Um, however, we decided to shoot inside the stable. I'll go to the next frame so you guys can see. Um, so not all these images have behind the scenes, but um, I try to capture as many behind the scenes photos as possible. But we, we moved into the stable, that way we could avoid the harsh midday sun. And I'm using a single light source there to be able to balance out um, the subject brightness with that very, very bright background. And uh, yeah, 1 400th of a second flash sync is pretty awesome in a, scenario, in a scenario like this as well. Okay, so another frame here. Um, for me, I am a very introverted kind of person, which is kind of funny. Uh, it's kind of ironic that I'm a portrait photographer because I'm very much an introvert. But the thing about my camera is that as cliche as this sounds, the camera gives me a window to the world. It allows me to connect with a lot of people that I would not ordinarily be able to connect with. And um, you know, to be able to learn someone's story and to be able to create an image of them that reflects their story it's very, very important to me. Um, a lot of times I do choose lighting techniques 
and lighting styles that are going to be more appropriate for the subject I'm photographing. Um, this gentleman here, um, his name is, uh, his name is uh, Donald, and I've known him for a number of years now. He is actually quite an accomplished writer, and so he has, uh, as I put it uh, in one of my YouTube videos, he has some writing that's a little bit on the controversial side. Some of his topics are a little bit more controversial, not the most easy topics to discuss. And so in one of his latest books, uh, you know, he really, um, well, he really went to kind of, uh, kind of shake things up, so to speak, a bit. And I wanted to create an, a portrait of him that would kind of reflect that a bit. So I did want it to seem a little bit more moody. Um, I wanted it to be a little bit, almost like he's on edge as I'm capturing these images. So you can see we have uh, a single light source again. In this instance, I am actually wanting to create a lot of additional shadow. You guys will notice that I have like a subtractive panel over here. That way we're really not filling in the shadows on the opposite side of his face. We're really, really getting that nice moody feel. And um, I also shot this at a very low angle with a wider angle lens than I normally would because I really want it to be kind of more in your face, so to speak, and that really, really helps sell the effect of the portrait. And uh, another point I wanted to make, this is, this is actually something that I thought about probably about 10 minutes or so before I went live today, and uh, because I'm always thinking about additional things. But one point I want to make too is that just because you're doing something like a group shot, don't think that you can't still use one light. Um, now, we do have different types of light modifiers we can use. Unfortunately, I don't have the space to really go through things in a proper hands-on demonstration. I will do a smaller hands-on demonstration at the end of this presentation. But yes, even if you're photographing a larger group, you can use a single light source. Uh, whenever we want to back our light up, we would use a larger modifier. I'm going to tell you guys why in just a moment. But one light can still be very appropriate even for creating a small group portrait such as this one. Okay, now <laughs> I have to, I have to kind of chuckle uh, whenever I get to this slide. Um, minimalist friendly. Now, as I rolled in here today uh, with a Pelican hard case, a shoulder bag, and a backpack, I don't think anyone really truly believes I'm much of a minimalist. Um, but the truth is I really do try to travel as light as I possibly can. I try to be uh, minimalistic with my gear choices and selections. So instead of me showing you guys a slide here, I'm going to show you guys something. So let's just say that I wanted to go and do a quick, uh, a quick uh, on location portrait session. You know, a lot of times obviously I'm going to have to have, you know, a camera and lenses. But as far as my lighting setup goes, so I don't have to drag in a bunch of gear, I might actually uh, just bring a small setup. So I have something here. Okay, so this is, this is kind of like my small, this is my small uh, sort of gear bag here. And this right here contains a light stand, it contains uh, a couple of umbrellas, as well as a stand adapter. And then we have a flash. So normally I would keep my flash in my camera bag, so it's right here. And the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because a lot of people will ask me, you know, Jeremy, I want to get into lighting, but, I mean, frankly, they'll say, hey, I don't want to carry all that extra crap around. But I'm just showing you that you don't actually have to carry a lot, a lot to be able to have uh, effective lighting ability. Okay, so you can see this is one of my umbrellas here. I have a couple of these. I have a uh, silver one as well as a shoot-through. It's a long topic, but basically I use the silver one whenever I'm outside because it's a little bit, reflects a little bit more light and it allows me to maximize the light output out of my smaller flash units. Okay, so we're going to do this. Okay, so this is like a little uh, Manfrotto Nano light stand. So you guys can see, I can take something like this fairly quickly. And I can open this up. Kind of like a travel tripod, this has a lot of sections to it. But yeah, you can see we can fold that out like that. Then we would take our stand adapter. 
So stand adapter goes into the front pouch there. We can take that. We can put it here. And then it's just a matter of putting our light on there. So in a pretty quick fashion, I am able to, I'm able to work, give our cameraman a workout as I move around all over the place. No, <laughs> but uh, in addition to that, I am able to have a fairly, uh, fairly quick setup with this. Yeah, so we have our, our light there. And this umbrella is actually 43 inches. But you can see that it folds up very small. I'm not going to actually set this up. I'm just going to kind of show you guys here. But anyway, so there's our umbrella. We would put that into our stand adapter. And we have a pretty nice and easy uh, setup here. So uh, this, this is a Profoto A1, but you could use any small speed light with uh, off-camera triggering ability. And that would allow you to get the job done. So. This is actually how I shot that image of Forrest earlier. This is the exact same lighting setup I used during our photo walk. So pretty easy to set up, not really a big deal. We'll set this off to the side. So yeah, so it can be, you know, with one light, you can do things in a very minimalist fashion fairly easily. Um, these days, if you didn't want to use a speed light, you could even use something like a smaller strobe uh, companies like Profoto have the B10, Godox, they have, comp they have uh, lights like the 8400, the 8200, all those little smaller strobes could be very good for this type of scenario as well. Okay, more budget friendly. So yeah, in photography there is no, um, my god, there is almost no limit on how much money you can spend on different pieces of gear. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much right now. But yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's, it's limitless, you know, almost how much you can, you can spend. Um, but the cool thing I like about lighting and the cool thing about using one light is that you can start fairly inexpensively. You know, you can buy a small light stand that's 20 bucks. You can buy a flash these days that's great for around 100 to 200 bucks and a trigger for your camera for around 50 bucks. And you can get started fairly easily these days. Now with lighting, the cool thing is, as time goes on, you can really start to add things. Um, a lot of folks want to get into using different types of soft boxes, you know, large octa boxes, things along those lines, strip boxes, beauty dishes, and on and on. But if you get something like, you know, a small flash and an umbrella, I still think that the umbrella is one of the most underrated things uh, out there these days. I mean, you can do a heck of a lot with an umbrella. Um, I might even have time to show you guys a trick I do with that later, but you can do a lot with an umbrella, so keep that in mind. I mean, you can start off fairly, uh, you can start off uh, in, a, in a pretty economical fashion with this. Okay, and it is easier to master lighting concepts, uh, and we're going to speak about these lighting concepts, of course, but yes, whenever we start talking about working with our light, it's very, very nice uh, to just kind of start one light at a time. A lot of people, they want to, you know, immediately set up a lot of different lights, you know, someone will uh, buy a light kit and immediately they start, you know, lighting up everything. But it's, it's really nice to just start one light at a time. Um, and it makes it much, much easier to see all the concepts of light. And uh, what concepts of light, you ask? Well, these concepts of light. Uh, one of the main things we think about with light is going to be light quality, you know. And when I say light quality, we start mainly thinking about... Um, one aspect, we start thinking about hard light versus soft light. Now, anything light related, I'll tell you guys the secret. Man, I should have I should have made this a YouTube video and I could have said, you know, Jeremy's big secret for lighting, you know, I have cracked all the lighting mysteries or something, I don't know. Um, but the secret is, look at the shadows. If you are trying to figure out something about light, you know, if you want to know about the light source, if you want to know where the light was coming from, the key is going to be the shadows. So keep that in mind. So if we think about something like hard light, for example, um, hard light is something that can be very, very beautiful. You know, a lot of people, 
I find that a lot of people, they want to immediately get the biggest possible softbox or the biggest possible umbrella, and they're thinking about making the light just as soft as it can be, but they kind of forget about hard light, you know? And I think, I think the reason being is because a lot of times, most of our first experiences with flash and with lighting is that little, you know, dinky pop-up flash that, thank God, most manufacturers have stopped putting on their mid to high-end cameras these days. But you see that little flash, it's always popping up and, and it's always casting hard shadows everywhere. But used properly, hard light can be a very good thing. So if we think about something like, uh, for example, fashion photography, a lot of times we can use hard light in those scenarios because, you know, hard light, first of all, it provides a lot of contrast, which makes clothes look uh, quite attractive. Um, you can see uh, my subject uh, here is wearing she is wearing a black leather jacket. If we take a closer look here, uh, you guys will notice that there's some pretty harsh shadows being cast. So you can see that her arm is actually casting a shadow down to her body here. And you can see many harsh shadows through here. If we kind of zoom in a little bit more, you guys can kind of see where the light is on her face. When we speak about hard light, the telltale look of hard light is going to be very, very crisp and very, very defined shadows. We're not going to have shadows that have, you know, feathered soft edges. We're going to have shadows that have more bold edges. Uh, there, there's more of a, of a harsh outline there. And you guys can definitely see that here. If we look at any of the shadows here below her chin, um, if we look even at the shadows on her cheek here, there's a bit of gradient, but it's still fairly harsh. So we can kind of see these characteristics. Another thing that we can look at in a portrait image uh, to kind of tell us about our light is going to be the catch light in the subject's eyes. So basically, a catch light is just that, that reflection of light within our subject's eyes. And so you guys will notice that that light source in her eye here is very, very small. So that also tells us that we have more of a hard light uh, type, of, uh, type of situation here. Now, if we think about if we think about lighting a little bit here, and this is kind of getting me over to the next topic I'm going to make, so I'm not gonna, I always jump ahead of myself it seems, but uh, I'm not gonna get too far ahead. But one thing to keep in mind about, uh, about light is that, you know, we start thinking about the size of the light relative to the subject. So you guys may have heard that, you know, if you wanna get very soft light, you need a bigger light source. But back when I was first starting out with lighting, you know, I, I wanted to get the softest light possible, so I did what a lot of photographers do. I went out and I bought the biggest lighting modifier I possibly could. Um, I think it was, uh, I don't even remember, I think it was like a five foot octa, and then I think I bought another light modifier. I think it was like, you know, like a big four by five uh, rectangular softbox or something, because I thought, you know, oh yes, you know, every photographer said, oh yes, if you want soft light, you want a bigger modifier. But you guys may have noticed how I just worded that. The quality of the light, is not just dictated by the size of the modifier. Notice that I said it's dictated by the size of the light modifier in, in relationship to our subject. So whenever I had my big, you know, three foot by four foot or whatever softbox it was, I noticed that sometimes I didn't have light that was as soft. And I thought, well, man, this is the weirdest thing. You know, this is supposed to be the softest light ever. Why am I, why am I seeing this change? Well, as it turns out, I was not paying attention to how close the light was to the subject. So put very, very simply, if you guys have a, a, um, a light source, it could be a big softbox. We could just say, it's a, let's say it's a five foot octobox. If that five foot octobox is 15 feet away from your subject, you are not going to have the same soft light qualities out of it that you would have if that light were five feet from the subject because it's all, it's all relative, right? So if we think about even the sun, the sun is massive, but if you have a, a day that is uh, you know, a very clear day, the sun is so far away, it's very small relative to us, so we still have harsh light. So this is all to say, when you start thinking about light quality, don't think about just the size of light modifier you're using, think about how close the, uh, the light is to the subject because relative to, uh, basically the, the quality of light is going to be relative to the size of the modifier compared to the size of the subject. So if you have a bigger scene, you want to get more spread, 
to your light and you back your light up, this is the time when we would use a larger light modifier. Now, again, because I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to like hit people in the head in here and we have very limited space. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pull out. Don't worry guys. You don't have to move the cameras around anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to pull, I know I pulled out some things already. I'm not going to just randomly pull out a five foot oxygen box right now. Okay. Um, but, uh, but anyways, but just kind of keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So continuing on though, with hard light, same type of scenario here. Uh, this day, wow. I, I, man, I, I feel like the longer I've been a photographer, the more I hit all the photographer cliches. But I tell you what, guys, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not kidding. This was a truly magical day um, for me. I mean, like, I thought the whole shoot was going to get canceled. It was raining all day. Uh, then it stops raining. And uh, we ended up with this type of effect. I love the fact that I was able to get all these, uh, all these reflections of the clouds uh, in, in, the, uh, in the little puddles here. And this glass wall here is all got water droplets. I mean, it's truly all the stuff that we go nuts for as photographers. And uh, after this, a rainbow came out. So, I mean, it was, it was quite something. Uh, but anyways, we're using hard light here. Now, let me, let me back up one second. This is officially off the cuff, but I thought about something, like I often do. If you are using a light modifier on a light, be aware that that light modifier does cut down on some of the light that's actually reaching your subject. So if you're in a situation where you have to back your light off very far from your subject to get more spread, if you have a very bright background that you're trying to match, you may not still be able to use your modifier. So this day, I had some closer shots of the subject that I captured with more of a soft light look. I used a larger umbrella. For this shot where I wanted to kind of pull the lights back and get more spread, I had to remove the light modifier and use more of a hard light look just simply to be able to get enough light output to be able to match the very intense sun that was previously behind clouds that, you know, that suddenly, suddenly came out. So, so keep that in mind. But anyways, if we zoom in on this one, you guys can kind of see the same types of things happening here, how we have obviously more hard light going on. We can see how there's a lot of contrast uh, in the light on her clothes here. And just like before, if we go in a bit closer, we can see that we have much more defined shadows on her face and we have a very small catch light here as well. Okay, so moving right over to this one. Kind of the same thing happening here. I think you guys are getting the idea of what I'm speaking about here in regards to hard light. Um, another point I'll make about this image, at some point, I'm, I'm really bad guys about like remembering who said what, but I do remember these quotes. Uh, there, was, there was a photographer, someone, somewhere, at some point, uh, said that nothing interesting in photography happens at eye level. And so for me, that's something that I really take to heart. And uh, I don't know, since I haven't gotten quite as old as Robert, I can still actually get down on the ground and then get back up again. Oh man, Robert's not in here to hear me. Oh well, he'll sit in the, in the, uh, in the replay, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, same sort of thing going on here. You guys can see that we obviously have hard light once again. Now here's the other thing too. I was speaking about catch lights just a moment ago. And uh, you know, a lot of times having that catch light in the subject's eyes can give an image of very, very warm and inviting feel. Um, whenever we see that, that nice sparkle in the eye. Notice though, in this frame, we don't have that. This image has a little bit different feel because of it. Here, what I did is I had my light just a little bit higher, so that way I wouldn't get so much catch light. And so when you don't have that sparkle in a subject's eye, it kind of gives the image a little bit more of an imposing kind of feel. Um, anyways, in this frame, it was intentional, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you go and take a photograph uh, of someone, it's like uh, it's like for their new for their new um, their new business, and they're supposed to be you know they're like a real estate agent, and they're looking they're, and they want to look very vibrant and invi inviting in their image. You want to be sure to get a nice catch light in their eyes. Uh, you would not want to do this in that type of context. So so keep that in mind. And this I I put this picture into the, into the slideshow basically so that I can just sort of like uh, flex on Robert a little bit. Uh, he was talking about, you know, not being able to get up earlier. Uh, so, yeah. 
I guess I can enjoy it while it lasts, you know. Now, thankfully, cameras do have tilty screens these days, so you don't have to really get down, but I don't know, I just don't feel as good about things if I don't come home from a photo shoot completely dirty. Okay, so soft light. You guys can probably tell where this is going. Um, once again, we're looking at the shadows to be able to determine what type of light we have in our scene. But instead of us having the very, very defined shadows with very crisp edges that we would have with hard light, here we have the opposite thing going on. Um, now, another point I'll make about this image is that it is shot on a cloudy day. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, on a cloudy day, that is a very great time to take outdoor portraits. But the one thing I do find is that oftentimes on a cloudy day, the light does lack a little bit of direction. And so it can be, again, a little bit, it can be a little bit uh, Xeroxy, we'll call it. That's going to be my new term I just coined. But uh, yeah, it can look a little bit flat. So a lot of times I still will use a light source, an artificial light source on a cloudy day just to give my light a little bit of direction, give it a little bit of extra, you know, extra pizzazz, right? So yeah, if we zoom in, you can see what's happening here. Um, instead of having that very, very small and sharp looking catch light in the subject's eyes, we can see that there's a larger catch light here. And uh, if you look closer, you can actually notice that there are diffuse edges to that catch light. And this right here is an example of what the available light looks like in the scene compared to the shot with artificial light. So over on the left, you can see this is exactly what I was talking about. I mean, a cloudy day can be a great time to take outdoor portraits, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it's very, very flat looking. Um, Cody's eyes look pretty dead, basically. Uh, we don't have any sparkle. There's no, there's no pop to the image. But over here, we have our light source, and you can see how that's changing things quite a bit. Yay, behind the scenes. <laughs> so you can see that we do have our, in this case, I believe it was like a four foot octobox I was using here, and I'm fairly close up. So we were getting very soft light out of that, uh, out of that light source. All right, and once again, you guys can, you guys are getting, you guys are getting the, uh, getting this. Um, oh man, should I tell, man, guys, should I tell them the secret? I guess I'm gonna tell you guys the secret. This image right here, I put this image on, uh, I believe I put it on, um, I believe it was on like my, my YouTube story or Instagram story or something like that. And uh, I was like, oh yes, guys, I'm still testing the Sony, uh, you know, I guess at the time was the A7R4. So I'm testing the A7R4 and, you know, this is one of my images. And I put some metadata in there, you know, like I always do with my images. I put, uh, you know, an aperture and a shutter speed and everything. And uh, anyways, I, I, I'm here to come clean today. Okay, no one throw anything at me. I'm coming clean today about this image. This is taken with an iPhone. Uh, this is not taken with an A7R4. Um, iPhone 11 Pro Max is what shot this image. Uh, so that shows you how important lighting is. Uh, Pro Photo, they've got this little app that allows you to fire their studio strobes even with the phone. So yeah, this is an iPhone picture. My God, I feel like I should just like put myself into witness protection over this or something. Um, anyways, but yes, that's how important lighting is. So yeah, three foot octobox here. So we got some nice soft light. Uh, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself, but yeah, the camera, we talk about cameras too much sometimes as photographers, we really do. And that's coming from Mr. Techie, Mr. YouTuber himself here. All right, so same type of thing with soft light. Let's see here, something compelling to say about this image. It's got soft light. How's that for, uh, for something compelling? No. <laughs> yeah, on this image right here, you can see those same types of characteristics. Uh, very, very soft uh, shadows here. This is the behind the scenes on this one. Again, a lot of times I will use the light source very, very close to the subject. That's how we're able to get that very, very soft light. Um, for this type of shot, a boom stand can be very handy. If you don't want to impede your camera's view to your subject, being able to have, you know, the light place, uh, or the light stand placed off to the side is very, very handy. Um, another point I'll make about this 
is that using a telephoto lens can be really good for this type of shot too. So I want to go back and just kind of show you here. I've been playing a game with myself to see like um, how long I could go without going back, but apparently it wasn't very long. So if we look at this again, you guys will notice that we're getting uh, our subject pretty much filling the frame here. But you guys saw in the behind the scenes shot how close the light source was to our subject. If I were shooting this closer up with a wider angle lens, my light would have been in the shot. So using a telephoto lens, that, narrow, that narrower angle of view is what allowed me to get that light really, really close and get the soft light, but also not like have the light showing up in the picture. So I believe I used the, the uh, I believe I used a 105 millimeter lens uh, in this photograph. And yeah, this camera is recording video. So I actually shot this frame uh, from even further back than where this camera is positioned. <laughs> okay, so another important thing to think about with lighting, and this is probably this is probably the number one question that I get about lights whenever someone buys a flash. They say, well, Jeremy, this all looks well and good, but tell me, where in the heck do I put this light? Do I put it over here? Do I put it over there? Now, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of uh, general rules of thumb about placing lights. People will tell you to place the light at a 45 degree angle. So if I'm here, For anyone that knows me, like I spend a lot of time just like walking around with the camera in my hands. I'm a, I'm a really hands-on kind of guy, so hence my light panel. But a lot of people will tell you, you know, if you are going to, um, you know, if you're going to light something, they'll say, okay, you've got your subject right here. So you want to get the light coming up at about a 45 degree angle, and they'll say, okay, put it off to a 45 degree angle, something like this right here, right? And so this is something that you'll hear. Uh, and, and this is not a bad place to start, but Whenever you're placing your light, there are some considerations. And one of the biggest considerations is just simply the light pattern that you want on the subject's face. So instead of me telling you guys exactly, okay, every time you should put your light at a 45 degree angle and every time you should do this and do that, instead of me telling you that stuff, I'm gonna just tell you what type of lighting patterns uh, you know, there are available to you. And I'm gonna tell you guys how to kind of like ensure you get that effect versus just saying, okay, always do this and always do that. So lighting patterns. One of the lighting patterns we think of is butterfly lighting. Now, at the end of this, depending on exactly how I'm running time-wise, um, which, how am I running time-wise? So is it to 440? We're going till 645, right? No, just kidding. We're, okay, so we've got 35 minutes. Okay, cool. So basically, if we think about butterfly lighting, butterfly lighting is going to be characterized by typically having our light source kind of more in front of our subject, more like this, kind of coming from this, thing, this direction. Um, preferably, your subject won't be wearing you know, their trademark hat. But uh, anyways, you'll have your light at that direction. And what, what we're looking for with butterfly lighting is we're looking for this particular shadow right here. Butterfly lighting is characterized by having this, this sort of shadow below the subject's nose that looks kind of like a butterfly wing. So that's essentially where we are there. Now, I'm gonna come back over and mention something else to you as well. Whenever we start talking about all these different lighting patterns, uh, keep in mind that as you're shooting your images, there's a couple things to keep in mind here. Number one, you may end up with light that is kind of in between patterns. Don't feel bad if your light doesn't fall exactly into one of these preset patterns and positions. It can vary a little bit, okay? So that's, that's okay. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is that if you are using different lighting methods, if you have a certain lighting style that you want, a certain lighting pattern that you want to create, be sure to educate your subject on that as well. Because what's going to happen is, if you have a light that's over on this side right here, and you know, you're getting a certain lighting pattern and your subject is moving around and turning in different directions, you're not going to still have that lighting pattern anymore, right? So whenever you are shooting, be sure to tell your subject, hey, the main light that I'm lighting you with is 
coming from this direction right over here. That's the main light. So you can say, hey, you know, move your body wherever you want to, but try to keep your face within this range because we're getting this type of light. You know, we have to communicate with our subjects uh, about these things. So, so, so do keep that in mind. Okay, so that's our butterfly lighting. We'll kind of continue on. So there's another lighting pattern that's uh, commonly used that's called loop lighting. And so loop lighting is basically characterized, uh, it's also characterized by a shadow um, cast by the nose, but instead of having this butterfly shadow directly below your subject's nose, you have a little bit different shadow pattern. You have that shadow pattern off to the side right here. And so basically you end up with this sort of loop shaped shadow this loop shaped shadow should not be, wow, loop shaped shadow. How, how about that? I deserve something for pronouncing that correctly. But you have this loop shaped shadow that's uh, just right here. Now it shouldn't be very long to the point to where it's connecting with the shadows on the opposite side of the face here, or on the same side of the face here. It should just be just, just a little bit right there. So that's kind of what we're looking for with that one. Also, as I go through these different photographs, you guys will no doubt see some different light qualities uh, that we uh, also previously discussed. If you guys can tell, uh, if you guys can tell like what types of light we have in these example photos, if you are uh, able to, write in the comments. I'm kind of curious to see if you guys can spot what light is hard light, what light is soft light. All right, so this is actually, actually a good friend of mine. I saw him earlier today. I, I decided I was going to put this in the presentation to see if he's actually watching it, uh, to see if he actually sees himself. He's definitely the best looking subject in all the photographs, um, especially since I didn't put any pictures of myself in here. So this is Rembrandt lighting. Rembrandt lighting is going to be kind of similar to the loop lighting in a way, except what's happened here is now our light source is kind of move slightly further. So we kind of, we're kind of moving across the face. And I'm going to show you guys this uh, with my lovely assistant over here in just a moment. Uh, but <clears throat> the light is kind of moving across the face. So instead of having our light, instead of having our light coming, you know, straight down and having a shadow right here, we're moving the light across the face and that shadow is just kind of getting longer and longer as the light gets further and further off to the side. So at this point, we have our light coming off very far at a very, very, very steep angle from the side. And that is making that shadow that's cast by the nose get much longer. And at this point, it's also kind of connected to all the shadows on the opposite side of the face. And so you get this one little side of the face that is opposite the light source that's still illuminated. And it ends up forming this sort of triangular sort of patch of light. And that is the telltale characteristic of Rembrandt lighting. So that's what we're looking for with this one. So I like this type of look. Um, it really creates a very, very moody, uh, atmospheric kind of look to the portrait. Some of the other different types of lighting uh, end up creating different looks. You know, the, the, uh, the butterfly lighting has a tendency to make for a little bit slimmer face. But when I want that moody and atmospheric type of look, the Rembrandt lighting is definitely, definitely my go-to. Um, if we think about another one, we think about uh, something like maybe split lighting. Split lighting is not something that I use a whole lot, uh, to be perfectly honest with you guys. But it's essentially characterized by being able to, you know, um, light up one side of a subject's face and then have the opposite side go completely to shadow. So yeah, we're just kind of going across the face here. I do this so my hat doesn't interfere. So yeah, we're kind of going across the face. We've kind of gone from here to over here to over here. And then with split lighting, we're just coming straight from the side. So that's kind of where we are with that sort of thing. Well, there's Robert. I was talking about him a second ago. He's off camera. Yeah, well, you'll see the playback. <laughs> I give you the long well. Well, well. Um, another, another thing that's interesting about light is that we have one more thing to mention about lighting direction. So we've kind of talked about these different lighting patterns, but there's one other thing to consider as well. And that is something uh, called uh, broad lighting versus short lighting. And this basically just tells us, this tells us where the light is going to be coming from uh, in relation to the camera. 
Uh, this is going to dictate whether or not you have the shadowed side of the subject's face facing the camera or if you have the illuminated side of the subject's face facing the camera. So you guys will notice here in the next slide that I have two different photographs here. Now, if you guys are kind of still, still uh, paying attention here, uh, write in the comments and tell me which, which one of these you like better. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, I was fortunate enough to be going through my photographs and actually find a photo of the same exact subject taken with both these lighting methods. And I thought that was very handy because these lighting, this particular uh, lighting method changes how a subject's face looks pretty drastically. If we think about something like broad lighting, broad lighting is going to be where we have the shadow side of the face facing away from the camera. So we can clearly see that our light source is coming here. So we've got that illuminated, say, uh, illuminated side of her face directly facing the camera here. On this photograph, it's the opposite. Here we have the shadow side of her face closer to the camera and our light source is coming from over here. The advantage to broad lighting is that broad lighting has a tendency to make a face look a little bit fuller. So essentially what we do there is, you know, by we're basically, it, it reminds me, it's, it's just, as interesting as this is, it reminds me of video games. It's uh, whenever you go into a certain video game and you, you, you're looking for the key to solve the puzzle. Wherever the key is, there's probably gonna be an illuminated area somewhere, right? You know, for all my gamers out there, you know? Um, so, um, anyways, but, but photography and portrait photography is kind of similar. Whatever we want to place the most emphasis on, that's what we need to put the light on. So if you have a, a subject with a face that may be a bit slimmer, you may want it to, make, you may want it to, be a, uh, to appear a little, bit, a little bit fuller, then you can have uh, the light placed on, uh, you may have the light placed to where the shadow is opposite uh, the camera, that way you get a fuller look to their face. If you have someone with a face that is a bit fuller, perhaps you want to uh, create the look of going for a little bit slimmer looking face, then that's where short lighting is your friend. So now we've got the light coming this direction, we have the shadow here, and it has a slimming effect. Another thing that I noticed about this is that if we start talking about uh, broad lighting, broad lighting in most cases has a tendency to put more emphasis on the subject's close. So you can notice how, you know, her top, I mean, I don't know, we could put this into, uh, we could put this into like a, a little ad for a boutique or something. It really show off the clothing well. But with the short light, uh, lighting here, it's, a, it's about her face a lot more. We don't have as much light on the clothes. There's more emphasis on her face. It's got more mood, more atmosphere. So you guys, you guys get what I'm saying here. So once you start using those given lighting patterns, then how you place the light and where, which side of the face you place the shadow on is also going to be a very, very important thing uh, to keep in mind too. Ah yes, some final thoughts. Okay, these must really, these better be my final thoughts because we're getting close to the end. But I am the last guy, so I can take as much time as I want, I guess. So some final thoughts here. This is something that I was going to get into earlier. Uh, the camera matters but it doesn't matter. So um, now <clears throat> I, have, I, I have been feeling very tongue in cheek about this whole thing all day long, uh, which is a bad thing with me. I'm kind of mischievous. Um, but uh, there's a certain website out there. One day they'll tell you, the camera, here's five reasons why the camera you're using doesn't matter. And then the next day they'll post an article and it says, here's 10 reasons why you suck if you're not using this particular camera. Now, I'm not going to tell you guys what that website is, um, you know, but their, their name is part of the exposure triangle. Uh, you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, I'm going to, oh my God, I'm going to get myself in so much trouble with that. Anyways, but yeah, here's the thing. Like most things in life, there's balance in the middle, guys. There's balance. So here's the thing. I, as I told you, am a very techie kind of guy. Um, I go through a lot of different cameras. The main reason why I go through a bunch of different cameras, honestly, is because I'm inherently curious. Uh, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of an IT guy turned photographer, but I also like spending time teaching others. And so when someone says, Jeremy, my Nikon camera is doing this, and Jeremy, my Fuji's camera do it, is doing that, I want to know what the answer is. I'm like, oh yeah, just go into the custom functions, go down the custom functions C3, go over, 
and then change that setting and then you're fixed. Are you sure it's broken? No, it's not broken, just do that, it's fine, you know? So I spend a lot of time with cameras and I change a lot of cameras frequently, but at the same time, I realize that the camera is not going to, a different camera is not going to artistically improve my images in any way. The choices that I make about cameras all have to do with all the conveniences for me as a photographer. It doesn't have as much to do with the final image. So kind of keep that in mind. <clears throat> so yeah, in this presentation, um, there's, there's some pictures that were shot with the camera that cost as much as a brand new Tesla. And since my secret's now out of the bag, there is uh, at least one image that was shot with an iPhone. Um, but you guys didn't notice that because you're looking, I want you guys to see the light, but just don't walk into the light, um, but, but see the light, okay? So that's gonna be the thing that makes the difference. Um, I know that people also like to talk about lenses. Overall, I would say that the lens is more important than the uh, camera in many cases. However, do keep in mind, the lens may not matter a whole heck of a lot either. If you're shooting in a situation where you're doing something like a studio portrait, you're mostly, in most cases, you're going to be stopped down anyway. You're going to be at a smaller aperture. You're going to be at f8, f11. And there's, I can tell you what guys, I've tested a lot of lenses. Even a super cheap plastic fantastic kit, kit lens is probably going to be pretty, pretty okay at f11. So keep that in mind. Now, if you start doing some outdoor types of images and you wanna you know, get that lovely bokeh that we're all addicted to, um, perhaps overly so, um, that's a situation where you may opt for a different lens to give you a little bit more depth of field control. So I guess the lens can matter a little bit more than the camera in that regard, but don't get too hung up on lens or camera here. I mean, your client is not going to look back and say, man, you know, God, man, Jeremy, dang, you know? If he had used that 100 megapixel Fuji GFX 100S instead of the Sony A1 that's only 50 megapixels, then man, you know, this image would be much, much better. You know, no, no one's going to say that. So I'm not telling you guys that the camera doesn't matter, but pick the camera based upon your preferences. You know, I'm gonna just leave it at that. I could just, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. Keep on going. Another thing to keep in mind is too, I know I've been talking about using artificial light a lot. But keep in mind that the sun is a light source too. You know, all these effects that we talked about are still going to be very, very useful, even with available light as well. Um, so I don't have a behind the scenes photograph of this. This photo is actually not really, eh, you know, I liked it when I captured it, but I've fallen out of love with it now. It's, it's okay. But I'm showing you guys this picture because I want you guys to see the time of day here. It was May 19th. It's 7.28 p.m. So the sun is gonna be going down later in the evening here. If you look at this, and then jump over to uh, the very next picture, look at that. Now it's 7.44 p.m. It's just a little bit after. What's happened here is our sun is going down a bit, and it's closer to the horizon. I'm actually getting a very, very nice Rembrandt lighting effect here, as if I placed a light source there. But instead, I was just aware of the time of day, I was aware of my environment, and I was able to get this type of effect. So I knew I was going to create this shot whenever I saw the sun, I was like, okay, we just need to wait a little bit longer, and we got this effect. So yeah, be very aware of the available lighting conditions too. This isn't always about placing a strobe. And if you are going to place a strobe in a scene, you can use a strobe or you can use the sun, rather, as your other light source. All right, guys, so now we're talking about using a second light source. So now it's time for part two of my presentation. We're gonna be talking about using multiple lights. No, no, just, just kidding. Um, but yes, uh, even if you are using one artificial light source, be aware of where the sun is. So here it's 6.27 p.m. Uh, we have our light source, uh, our artificial light source coming from this part of the frame. We're getting a Rembrandt-esque type of lighting pattern again but we have our sun setting, our starting to set over in this direction and we're getting that nice backlight uh, here. So it makes a very, very big difference. You guys can kind of see where, where the sun uh, was coming from here and then you could see how my artificial light source was, was uh, filling in the shadows on, on the opposite side. Man, I feel kind of awkward posting this like, 
I mean, Joel Grimes had his presentation uh, pr uh, prior to mine, and I've got the softbox with his name on it in, in this frame. I'm just like, I'm just like, okay. Anyways, all right. So in terms of uh, the sun placement, this company is not paying me anything. They should give me some affiliate links or something, I guess. But um, I do use this app quite a bit called Sun Surveyor. Because remember, guys, I'm a techie guy, as I've mentioned. So I do like to use this app a lot to really track the pattern of the sun. Uh, they have this thing that they do that's a, uh, it's a uh, augmented reality view. So you can turn your, it turns on your phone's camera and you look at the screen and then you can hold up your phone and you can actually see where the sun is and, and plot the path of it. You can put an address in there and figure out where the sun is going to be in, in advance. Um, None of the things I've shown you in these photographs were by accident lighting wise. There's been plenty of times when I said, okay, the sun is going to be right there. Uh, I don't want you guys to have the impression that it was just like a happy accident. Uh, it was not in most cases. So this is a way that I'm able to kind of figure out where the sun is going to be and use that to my advantage. Okie dokie. So this is about the end. So for those of you that may be tuning in late, if you want to follow my work, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, but I'll mention again now that I can be found on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I am known as Photog J the Great on all those platforms. You can check out my website at jsmith-photography.com. And I have a YouTube channel here as well. I would appreciate this subscription. So we've got to get to like 5 million. I don't know. Anyways. So, but yes, this kind of concludes things, guys. Um, I was going to do a little bit... I suppose, I suppose before I go, this is like an Apple keynote, you know, just one more thing, right? Okay, so let's see here. All right, so I'm gonna just kind of briefly show you guys some things here. See, this is what happens when you're the last presenter. You get to make the camera crew work a little bit hard, you know. Before they, they, they you know, they, they were gonna spend just a little bit of time tearing this stuff down, but they need just a little bit more work before they do. Wow, okay. Don't go too close, you know. She, she had an accident. She had a rough night or something. Uh, I don't know, okay. There we go. She kind of has a face for radio, but that's okay. All right, so anyways, okay, let's see. You don't have to worry, I'll, I'll just turn the light down a little bit there. Okay, that's good. All right, so you guys can kind of see what I was talking about before. This is just a quick demo, but you can kind of see if I do something like this. Oh wow, okay, we're turning off lights, cool. <laughs> okay, so you guys can kind of see right here, this is kind of more of our, more of our butterfly uh, lit pattern. So if we have our light here, so for this type of light pattern, you can see where you'd want to have a boom stand or something, because otherwise you're going to get in your own shot, just like my arm is getting in the shot here. But as we start moving the light off axis here, we can kind of start to see some different lighting patterns form. So see, there's that loop lighting pattern I spoke of earlier. So see, as I move over, you can see that loop kind of form there. Now when I go all the way over, that's where all the shadows start to converge and we get Rembrandt lighting. And if I go all the way over to the side, this is where we're starting to get more of our split lighting effect. So you guys can literally see how as we move this light around, we get those different, different effects there. So anyways, just a quick little demo to kind of show you. Um, hopefully, if you guys are local to us here in Little Rock, definitely come to the photo walk. And uh, I'll be demonstrating a lot of these things in person. And uh, we'll have a little bit more time to kind of, uh, kind of do things. And I won't be in a cramped room. So definitely come on out if you get the chance. And I guess this is... A all right, we have a question from Jennifer. Oh, we have a question, okay. She's a new photographer starting out in artificial lighting. Okay. And she would like to know, what are your suggestions for a basic kit for a new photographer getting into flash photography? Okay, so great question, Jennifer. Um, I would say, and, and yes, um, I apologize, guys. I forgot that we had questions, so that's awesome. Um, I've been like, hey, guys, write me, give me questions, and then I almost didn't answer any of them, so, so my apologies there. Uh, but yes, as a photographer starting out with lighting, there's basically two different paths you can take. Um, and in order to figure out which path to take, I would ask myself a question. The question is, do you need 
Uh, do you need lights that are more portable? Are you going to be doing more things that are on location? Or are you going to do something that is more set up in a studio type of environment? Um, for most people, I would say that going a more portable route would be better. Just because these days we have such compelling uh, battery powered lighting options, um, I am a really big fan of a lot of the Westcott products that have come out lately. Uh, they have a light called the FJ400 if you want more of a studio style strobe, but it is still battery powered. And so you can actually, you know, travel with it easy on location. Uh, unlike a small flash, you actually can put it. So like if you have a small flash like this, the downside to this is that you can't really attach anything to this um, unless you have a special bracket. So if you're going to be doing something that's uh, where you're going to be using a lot of different modifiers and, or something like that, I would get a smaller battery powered strobe like that Westcott FJ400. Or if you want something a little bit smaller and easier to travel with, something like the FJ200 could be very good too. If you're going to be doing something where you want to go as small and light as possible, then that's where I would go with like a smaller speed light. Uh, like say a Westcott FJ80 uh, or the Godox V860. Uh, those would be some good options uh, for those things. Excellent. We have one more question. Okay. Kyle would like to know, if you had to choose only one modifier to do portraits, what would it be? Wow. Only one modifier. Okay. So let's see here. If I had to only pick one, one modifier, you know, I think I would, I think I would pick an umbrella. I would pick a mid-sized umbrella. Um, I am a big fan of this umbrella. What is it called? The uh, Fotec soft lighter. So I would pick that as my only modifier. I have one that's about 60 inches. And the thing I like about this umbrella is that it's a bounced, uh, bounce style umbrella, but it's convertible. So I can take the backing off it and I can shoot through it, or I can leave the backing on it and bounce it, or I can even put an outer diffuser on it and use it more like a softbox. Uh, so yes, if I could only pick one modifier, I would definitely pick some type of, uh, some type of umbrella. That Fotec soft lighter is nice, but there are others out there too that have a similar design. Excellent. Well, that wraps okay. everything up, Jeremy. Thank you so All much. Right. We had great comments online about awesome. your presentation. Uh, everybody enjoyed it. Sandra was on there. Deborah said they enjoyed the presentation. They loved seeing the different light patterns demoed. They were very happy for that. Awesome. I know if you're with us and you're inside the Little Rock area, we are going to have a photo walk led by the amazing Jeremy the Great Smith. Had to get that down. And now I know why <laughs> they call him the Great. And if you don't know the answer to that or the reason why, leave us some comments in there and we might get back to you and actually share that personal yeah. information about Jer Jeremy's life. It was a great presentation and you guys are looking for that last code word to get those extra votes to win those door prizes. And that last one is Nikon. So I hope you guys really enjoyed all the great presenters, including our amazing local Jeremy Smith during this two days of Photo Expo Live. So be sure to stop by any of the stores to see our trade specials. They're all open until 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. But our e-store, our electronic store online, bedfords.com, will be available with show specials using the code Expo Live until midnight on Sunday. This is Robert Trawick and Jeremy Smith signing out, and we'll see you for the photo walk tonight. Take care, guys.